This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 857, recorded on January 21st, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast All About Viruses, Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. And out the window, it looks okay, but if you go outside, it's windy and it really is cold. There is a winter, after all. It's almost zero degrees. And that, there morning, can't be a lot of humidity uh, in zero degrees. So. This morning, it was minus 10 Celsius. That's it was right. really it was That's painful. Right. That's right. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm a little sluggish here because I'm messing around with my uh, browser, but I can tell you right now that it's 48 degrees in Austin. And uh, recall oh, me 48. that, uh, let me see, what's the Friday? Recall that three days ago, it was like 75. Right. Yep. Okay. Fluctuations, um, yeah. Yeah, fluctuations. Uh, yeah, 48 going up to 50. It's going to freeze again tonight. We're all good. Sunny, by How, the way. How's the citrus crop doing? Uh, I can't see it out my window, so I can't tell you. <laughs> you know, that's what the big fear is down there during the wintertime, right? Uh, sure. You know, when I was in Florida, the uh, line, uh, the uh, the latitude where you could grow citrus changed. Yes. Uh, while I was there. It, it, went up. it moved. It moved south because there were a couple of south. freezes. That, wow. Yes. Oh. But, I mean, that's going to. Well, uh, I was going to say it would move back north now with climate change, except that they built houses where all the citrus trees were. So <laughs> take care of that. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Uh, I agree with Dixon. It is pretty chilly out there. I've got <laughs> 22 Fahrenheit, negative 6 Celsius. Um, and thus, I am very excited to be in my office. <laughs> Our guest today is coming to TWIV for the fourth time. Uh, fifth. Is oh, it fifth? Boy. I think so. I think anyway, fifth. what I got is 208-597, the last one, 620, May 2020, from the National Institutes of Health. John Udell, welcome back. Uh, great to be back. Uh, we're looking at 25 degrees in Bethesda, Maryland, wind out of the northwest at four miles an hour. Uh, coldest it's been here in a couple of years, at least. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'd be. John, are, are you in your office at NIH there? I, I am indeed. It looks <laughs> a little like Disney World. <laughs> Could you put anything else on your wall, do you think? Uh, well, this is like, I've been here, what, I'm up to my 35th year. This is 35 years of accumulated... Oh, yeah. Material that my wife will not let me have at home. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope I want to point out the uh, that the Fauci bobblehead. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and that's cool. That's very cool. And then something my daughter uh, found for me. The oh, good Fauci, Fauci action figure. The Fauci action figure, removable mask. So yeah. yes. <laughs> Your uh, office reminds a, is, me. Go ahead, go ahead, Rich. Is that a Tennessee uh, letter up there? No, oh, that's yeah. Tuckahoe High School, where in out, uh, just just north of New York City, where Absolutely. I um, Absolutely. where I went to high school. Yeah, I just had my fiftieth reunion this fall, so that was right. wow. Yeah. So I forgot. I I know that you're right. You are here for the fifth because I forgot the one you did with your son. In that New was York. amazing. Yeah, that was one of yes. the highlights of my life, actually, to do that with Teddy. How is he so, doing? He's doing. He's looking for jobs now. So. Uh, looking for faculty jobs, so he's done really, really well. All right, great uh, at Sloan Kettering, and yeah, that was a what a great episode that was for us. So yeah, um, I have to say that uh, Rich and I uh, many years ago went to interview Tony Fauci in his office, and and his office is full of stuff just like yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not just like John's. John's is is got ten x stuff. Yeah, well, and, has and, a lot, but John's yeah. is really. Well, Tony's got honorary degrees that literally leak out of his office because he's <laughs> right. John, uh, John I, you I don't have a single honorary degree. You look like uh, you have I, to keep two anthropology <laughs> students busy for uh, their PhD. Maybe. I, here, here's the roof. <laughs> oh my gosh! No, that's like that, that's anthropological. That's very anthropological. <laughs> One of the things I remember about Tony's office was his running shoes sitting over by his desk. Yeah, Tony's right. a serious runner. He still he um, well, it's COVID now. We haven't been in the fitness center, but 
Uh, I, I work out a couple of days a week. I often see Tony there on the treadmill and wow. he used to, he used to be a marathoner, uh, a very fit guy. And you, you know, exercise works, right? I mean, it really yeah, it does. does. And Tony you does bet. not look his age. That's for sure. No, no. So it's, uh, you, you haven't been on Twiv since really the beginning of uh, the pandemic. So a lot has changed and a lot that we didn't anticipate. So let's see if we can catch up. Um, I wanted you to start because you're so good at it to give our, we have many, many new listeners since you were on last. You will be amazed at how our numbers have shot up because people are looking for information and they, what better place, uh, virologists and immunologists. Uh, so give our listeners a primer on how, um, when you get infected, you get vaccinated how do you make antibodies? Oh, good, good question. Uh, how do you make <laughs> yeah. antibodies? Right. So, <laughs> two different ways. Okay. So when you when you get in when you get a RNA vaccine, um, the RNA goes into the muscle cells at least and makes uh, a lot of the protein, the spike protein. It probably also goes into um, resident immune cells called dendritic cells. Uh, in both cases, one way or another, the antigen has to get back to a lymph node which is where the immune response starts. And um, even if the protein's made in a, in a muscle cell, something's got to carry it back. And that's probably going to be a dendritic cell, uh, which itself, as I said, could be making the protein or it's schlepping the protein back from the muscle. It goes into a lymph node um, and it's, it's got to do a couple of things. One, um, it's got to find a B cell and... It's got to find a naive B cell, which isn't so easy because they aren't very prevalent. Uh, naive B cells are B cells that, by definition, have not seen an antigen yet. So the naive B cell then is um, going to um, bind the spike by its antibody on its surface. Uh, it's going to internalize it, and it's going to uh, process the spike um, for antigen presentation to, um, to T cells. And the dendritic cell will, will do this as well. And through this um, highly choreographed event, which um, perhaps Gabriel talked to you guys about, right? Because he's really the world's expert on what goes on in a dendritic cell with B cells. The B cell and the T cell get together um, and the T cell provides the cytokines and other factors that the B cells need to optimally proliferate. Uh, so that's going to take that whole, getting that whole um um, show together that that ballet. It's going to take B cells. So oh, I don't know. In the end, a week or a week week to ten days to start to make the kind of really good antibodies called the IgG antibodies. Before that, um, before if you don't have a T cell, if you just get antigen from a dendritic cell, um, or the antigen somehow otherwise finds its way into the lymph node, the B cell will also get activated. Uh, and even if it's going to get help, it's going to start with an IgM. Uh, and the IgM is um, a form of antibody that's designed for um, initial responses. And the way we think it's designed for that is that instead of having two heads, uh, which, have, uh, which can bind the antigen, the IgM actually has five times two. So it's got five IgG-like antibodies that are connected at their base by a, a piece um, uh, uh, that connects them all together, and it makes a tenmer. And because it's a tenmer, um, it can bind much more tightly to an antigen um, like a virus than it can as a dimer. Um, and so the IgMs are are quite big. And even if the antibody isn't a great antibody to start, it still binds incredibly avidly to to the virus. And so it provides this immediate protection. You start making you start detecting IgM antibodies by about day five. And I think one of the puzzles in immunology, um, important puzzle, you know, we're, we're incredibly sophisticated immunology, as Brianne knows, as you guys know, it's incre incredibly complicated. Almost every week there's a new molecule defined or a new process and new signaling. And, you know, it's just we're peeling the onion infinitely, of course. But there are some really basic questions out there that you know, young scientists may miss. They may think, "Oh man, all the all the really important basic questions 
are gone. But that's not really true. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And, and one of the lowest hanging fruit to me, which really has not been addressed, is what's wrong with IGM? I mean, it's, you know, okay, it's big, but, you know, there probably be ways around that. And so moving it around the body maybe is not so easy. And getting it from the blood into a tissue maybe is not so easy, although there would be ways to do it. But what's wrong with having this thing, which I, I don't want to get into math because I think it'll confuse people, but with the average uh, quality of the antibody that the, the naive B cell has, the IgM basically should bind irreversibly to any antigen if it can... It, even if even it can interact with only a few of the ten binding sites, and but it it's not good enough, right? Kind of. Um, and um, one of the crucial issues in immunology is why is that so? And then what are the advantages then of of then converting to an IgG and having all these just different kind of adapters? You know, so the IgG molecule in a way it's like a um, what's the analogy? You know, like one of these tools you could put different heads on it, right? In this case, you're putting different tails on it. So you, you have all these adapters for IgG, and they all kind of do different things. And that's another, it's not, I wouldn't say it's low-hanging fruit because people are working on that, but, um, and it, it does get really complicated. But we have all these different uh, uh, kinds of antibodies, and it's not clear exactly why that is. Oh, okay? I think that, I, I feel like I've just uh, tied a whole bunch of things together the, with the way that you phrased that, because what I feel like I'm realizing is that everything you're saying here is yet another reason to say uh, that there's clearly an importance of types of antibody responses other than neutralization, um, given I, 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 all of the FC-dependent functions I, of the things other than M. I, I, absolutely. And, and the, the thing with IgM as well is there are also IgM memory cells, which I think we all tend to forget, and <laughs> they are there for a purpose. So there probably are unique aspects of IgM that are useful, which is why you maintain a population of IgM memory cells. And for the uninitiated, a memory cell means you already have made the B cell, so they're in much larger numbers. And they also, because they've already kind of passed the quality control test, something we didn't talk about, which is in part of every immune response, is um, the immune system is always walking this, uh, this, this very fine ledge between dealing, uh, killing a pathogen and killing yourself. So <laughs> this possibility of autoimmunity is something the immune system is thinking about every microsecond. Right, and right. basically every immune mechanism you're going to trigger, it has to go through the gauntlet of not reacting with self. And right. that is not perfect, of course. Right. Um, and, you know, as we know, and we'll probably talk about, you know, the, the disease with COVID and many viral infections is not necessarily due to the death caused uh, by the virus of the of the target cells, it's very often caused by the overenthusiastic immune response, uh, which can be very dangerous. And anybody with an autoimmune disease know uh, this, sure. this can this can be detrimental to your health, and it can even kill you. And uh, you know, one of the huge advances in immunology in the last many decades is um, is the use of checkpoint inhibitors and other ways of manipulating the immune response in immunotherapy of of, of tumors, which there have been miraculous cures, including my, my best friend from college who's alive because of immunotherapy. But the flip side of that, uh, you unleash the immune system, you're often going to have to deal with some very, very serious autoimmune consequences. And you know that the immune system does as well as it does as an immunologist. Um, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, it's a very difficult thing because the immune system is, is, is protean in its capacity. And this was recognized way back when antibodies were first discovered in the late 19, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, the, you know, the Germans were heavily involved in this. They had all these new compounds they were making from organic chemistry. So these were, these were things that never existed before in, in the universe, as far as we know, right? At least not in any sizable quantities. And right. yet, when they injected animals with these novel substances, they could make a perfectly good immune response. So the immune system is plastic enough that it can respond to things that it has never, ever seen in evolution, which is, right. it's amazing, right? And antibodies yeah. don't just recognize proteins. They recognize everything, basically. Any kind of organic compound, they can recognize. Um, and so that's, to do that and then not kill yourself, that's a very difficult uh, problem in, in protein recognition. Right. So, okay, John, so, are there... 
Are there any animals, excuse me, are there any animals along the phylogenetic tree of life which only make IgM? Mm, not, not that I know of. Uh, sharks, um, right. where, you and know, fish. The, all, yeah, they make, sharks have their own. Sharks have an, I, sharks have an IgM. They have a, a shark-specific antibody that's a single-chain antibody like, like camels have. And then they have something like we have. Um, so, okay. no, I don't, I don't know that there, there is actually, uh, so, and lamprey also have, you know, we had this, one of our best papers actually is a paper where we show the lamprey, which makes something completely different from an IgG. It's called a VLR. Uh, it's a whole different protein, but the system apparently is very similar. Uh, even though, you know, the, the jawless vertebrates, uh, branched off four or 500 million years ago, it's just basically lamprey and hagfish in that group. They have their own adaptive immune system, which has uncanny parallels to the adaptive immune system that all the jawed vertebrates have. And uh, one of the cool things that we showed was that uh, on a given viral antigen, they basically recognize the same parts of the viral antigen, the same antigenic sites that our antibodies recognize at every mammals and birds and amphibian and fish, probably. We've actually shown that we haven't published it yet. Um, recognize, the lamprey recognize as well. So it is, there is kind of this universal ability to recognize foreign substances uh, by proteins. But uh, again, it's miraculous how, how well this works. And, you know, that it works at all is kind of <laughs> amazing. And I don't think we can complain too much that it isn't perfect. At the risk of uh, <clears throat> going down a, at least a bit of a rabbit hole, I want to uh, test my own knowledge of a subtlety in this whole uh B cell uh, recognition of antigen and antibody making thing that for me was an epiphany this year, but i would see if I've got it right. And that is, you said that naive B cells recognize, may recognize an antigen, internalize that antigen, process it, present peptides on the surface. T cells recognize those peptides and stimulate that uh, B cell to move forward in its uh, and antibody production, maturation, proliferation. So the subtlety to me is that the T cells don't necessarily know what epitope those B cells were recognizing. All they no, know, no, they don't. All, well, all they know is that this B cell uh, or this peptide uh, came from a protein somewhere in the protein that that uh, that that B cell recognized okay yeah it doesn't yeah right exactly right uh rich but the cool thing is and this is a paper from the 70s um uh the first one from australia uh I got lou and russell i never forget that paper it was fantastic they showed that with something like a virus right where the whole thing goes in at once the the t-cell doesn't have to recognize the same protein that the b-cell does oh that's interesting right okay. and so like with flu the most abundant protein is matrix right? Because it's a shell of 3,000 molecules it's a, under the HA. And uh, they showed that you can have a T-cell specific for matri a matrix peptide that helps um, that helps uh, B-cell specific for the HA. And uh, what's really striking there as well is that matrix, for whatever reason, is a really, really crappy B-cell antigen. You can make antibodies to it, uh, but it's hard. The first hybridomas I ever made uh, in my career, and I've made thousands, the first one was to matrix for my PhD thesis. And that was hard, actually, because it's such a crappy imidogen. But uh, so the B cells in that case would recognize the surface of the virion, the HA, bring the particle in, it gets processed, and then the matrix peptides get put on an MAC class two molecule. We'll probably talk about class one molecules later, and I can explain the difference uh, a, a bit at that point. And that then provides the help. So that, that paper is a fantastic paper. That whole mechanism there really have been very few other papers that have looked at that. Uh, Shane Crotty had a good paper with pox viruses where it didn't look like that was terribly important. But more recently, there uh, I think Andrea Sant, who studies flu, had papers really supporting the old model. And I think the old model is probably right, that um, you get this linked, this what's, what's known as linked recognition. Uh, and, I, and if we're losing... People, we understand it. Okay, so don't, <laughs> don't feel like don't feel like you're 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 you know you're, you're you've done something wrong here. Um, it, it gets really complicated. 
And well, the, ep- the epiphany for me resulted from trying to think about how it was that you could have a recognition of conformational epitopes. Okay. By the B cells. Uh, by, by the linked, uh, what do you call it? Linked? Yeah, linked exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Because the antibodies, you know, the antibodies can see, I mean, the antibodies do see denatured uh, uh, proteins. Okay. But the, I think it's just much harder to bind with high affinity a piece of spaghetti than it is, um, uh, what's a, an analogy, you know, just a, a form structure, right? So uh, uh, an indi- a peptide is, it's wobbling all over the place. Uh, a ZD, a, a ZD. Yeah, it's, right? So it's, <laughs> it's, much, it's much easier to recognize a surface. And, 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 and certainly for an antibody, um, for viral proteins, for the most part, there are a few exceptions, but almost all the useful viral antibodies, even if they're not neutralizing, they're going to recognize the native protein. And they're not going to recognize the denatured protein. So, and that's that's a really critical distinction. And uh, another kind of lowish hanging fruit that no one studies, despite that, when you look, uh, and there aren't a lot of papers, but there are a few, there are plenty of antibodies against things that look useless. And it's not clear that they're completely useless, right? But it's certainly in the assays that, that we measure, like neutralization assays that you guys are always talking about, Almost all those antibodies are specific for native forms of the uh, viral protein of spike. Nature and abhors uh, uselessness. Yeah. Uh, generally, <laughs> but you know, Dixon, it just sometimes it doesn't, right? And, <laughs> no, it's you just know, so we don't know it. You know, like they used well, to talk about uh, um, the, junk the, the DNA. DNA, the selfish yeah. DNA, the, all junk that stuff. DNA, that, completely, completely come stupid. On, Call we, something. We've, eventually, yeah. we found out what it does. So. But yeah, there are, yes, the there are you know, but at the same time, uh, nothing's perfect and nature does make mistakes and then it has ways of dealing with them. So right. it's, it's just, it's probably always a mistake. It's always, it's always a mistake to think a mistake is only a mistake. So that's, exactly. yeah, it's, right. it's not a mistake. <laughs> it's an experiment. Well, yeah. R- for Rich or, or for any of ask. the listeners who, um, were unclear about linked recognition, basically the thing that the B cell recognizes and the thing that the T cell recognizes, those two epitopes have to be physically bound together so they can both be internalized at the same time. That, that's it. That's right. That's the key feature. That's the key feature, right? And so that's right. And that, you know, that was a breakthrough for the pneumococcal vaccine because uh, the pneumococcal vaccine is based on antibodies recognizing sugars. T cells don't do well with that. Uh, MHC molecules don't like to present sugars. Uh, and so the key there was hooking up the sugar to a protein. So they were then linked. Right. All right. So getting back to our uh, initial, I uh, see uh, with John, I know you can ask him one question and he can talk for an hour. It's great. Um, when we put this antigen in a person and you, you've talked about the B cell chore- chore- choreography, if you don't do it again, how long does that go on? So you just inject mm. some antigen in a human, how long will the... <laughs> nice song. <laughs> I recognize that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, how long does it, that go on? Good good question. Yeah. I mean, the germinal centers continue for many months. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my son just had a really nice paper um, showing that in mice, the germinal centers go on for more than six months. And okay. I think... Um, you know, in humans, it's kind of it's it's a bit harder, but uh, I think Ali Albedi has some really nice work as well, where you can find uh, germ- what look like germinal centers from biopsies uh, mm-hmm. many many months after immunization or infection. So that goes on for a long okay. time. And what's going on is really cool. Um, what's going on is what maybe the the coolest thing in nature, right? In evolution, which is a somatic uh, mutation of antibodies. So you know, generally the genetic information you want to be really, really careful with. And, you know, we, we invest a lot in protecting the genome, right? So that mistakes, they do happen, but mutations happen. But we have all sorts of repair and correction mechanisms. But B cells do the exact opposite, right? They have this enzyme that deliberately mutates their immunoglobulin genes, but it turns out there are other targets as well uh, for this that maybe are intentional and maybe are not. And the... Um, the immunoglobulin genes that are making the um, IgG, not with the IgM, it doesn't happen there, with the IgG, they get mutated. And then we have a little mini mini evolution that goes on in the germinal center, just Darwinian selection of which antibodies 
can bind the most tightly to, to antigen. And that is, that is what improves the quote unquote quality of the antibodies is this affinity maturation. And, you know, why that is, is another question that really hasn't been addressed terribly carefully. And, you know, it used to, we used to think that the affinity of naive antibodies for, um, for things like, like spike were really very low. And that was a prejudice based on original studies, uh, where, where the main, um, um, uh, pr- the main substances studied were sugars, some really old work that kind of set the field up, B- brilliant work and where somatic hypermutation was discovered. And there, and I'll give you a number for the, for people who could deal with it there, you know, the average affinity of like a, of a primary antibody is something around one micromolar. In other words, at a concentration of one micromolar, half of the antigen will be bound by the antibody. That's actually a really crappy affinity. And one micromolar of antibody is a lot of antibody. Right, and you, you couldn't maintain a system very well um, where where that was the affinity. Antiviral antibodies. It turns out the starting affinity is probably a thousand fold higher. Uh, pretty good. It's uh, it's then we're now down to a nanomolar. That's pretty damn good. But it's not good enough, apparently, because with somatic hypermutation, then you have a limit of about a thousand fold more, uh, ten to the you know picomolar now um, that the antibodies can be. And um, okay, so the questions here: uh, If we have the equal um, activity of an antibody, say we have ten times, uh, say we have antibodies that differ tenfold in their affinity, if we normalize it so they're going to bind an equal amount of antigen, do they have the same biological effect? Well, we don't know that answer. It's a really important question. And the reason do we have affinity maturation is that to make room for other antibodies in our blood, right? So because we have a certain limit. Um, basically every animal has something like 10 or 15 mg per mil of antibody in their blood. Okay. And it doesn't really go much higher than that. It doesn't go much lower than that, at least not in mammals. Uh, What's we the found half-life? Out in, uh, well, the half-lives are all different, Dixon, of the various oh, okay. heavy chains, right? But so we're always making that amount per day. And uh, mind you, what we all study is the blood antibodies because it's easy and, you know, for viruses, they are relevant. But that being said, 90% of the antibodies we make are actually going, we're losing every day. A lot in the toilet, actually, right? Because most of the antibodies we make, uh, 90%, probably 90% of those are in our gut. And those every day when you use the, the toilet for number two, that's where the antibodies go. And that's where most of the antibodies you make are replacing. And we also make them in you know, our nasal secretions when, when we spit, all that. That's also antibodies that are coming out of our body. Um, that explains so, why my toilet never caught a cold. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, but we have this limit of how much antibody we can make. And one of the possible reasons for affinity maturation is to make room for everybody. You know, by the end of your life, you're, you're going to be you're going to be exposed to a lot of different immunogens and you want to maintain the capacity. That being said, there are some papers now that have been published by the, the first group to be able to do mass spectrometry on antibodies. Now, mass spectrometry is a technique where you literally measure the weight of a given substance, like an antibody. And to do that, it's really it's technically extremely demanding, and um, you have to really be an expert in this. And machines are a million dollars, and every three years they're way better, and you have to go and buy a new one. It's a really incredibly cool field that's having applications all across biology. Uh, the first guy to be able to figure out how to do this is a guy named George Giorgio at the University of Texas, who uh, to do this, you actually have to have all the sequences of the antibodies you want to measure, which means you have to figure out a way of sequencing individual B cells. And they were one of the first groups, if not the first group to do that. So they did that. And then they also got um, matched those sequences of the antibodies uh genetically to the sequences of the antibodies in the mass spectrometer. So now you have a way of quantitating individual antibody species for the first time, right? So you guys are always talking about monoclonal antibodies, right? Because they've changed medicine and we we could talk about them, how they work, what what good are they as as drugs, et cetera. But uh, basically the immune system is built of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, How many are there in our blood at any one time? Many millions. Okay, and what this work did for the first time was show exactly how diverse they are, at least with 
in terms of the abundant ones. And the, what the remarkable finding is, is that people, I'm not sure exactly what the age was, certainly 60, 65, people over 65, including uh, most of the people on the screen here, <laughs> everyone but Brienne, we actually almost have like little lymphomas going on where most of our antibodies, we all have basically what are known as oligoclonal responses at that point, where most of our antibodies are dominated by just a few antibodies. Right. So this is a whole new kind of way of understanding the immune system that I think the field is just coming to grips with. And, you know, how does it OK? Why is this important? Um, very few of us are going to get multiple myeloma. So not that or B cell lymphomas. It's not a very it's a terrible cancer, but it's not super common. It, it's important because one of the critical findings with with SARS-CoV-2 and every other virus for that matter, who does it kill? Old people. Why does it kill old people? Well, uh, lots of our bodies are running down, but one of the things that also runs down is our immune system, right? And this senescence of the immune system um, is a really important feature of, of vaccinology, of course, and old people are much, much more difficult to vaccinate. We, we don't respond as well to infection. We don't respond too well uh, to vaccines. And uh, I would guess one of the factors here is that the B cells aren't doing terribly well at this point. Um, so, another why is, uh, what's the what's the biological reason for immune senescence? Do we understand? Um, I don't think we do. Um, yeah, I'm again entropy. I, it would be my guess. It's hard to maintain systems for a long, long time. And you know, there are animals. If there's not like there's an absolute lifespan, um, there are sharks now. I think that live 500 years. Right, uh, they, the green, the, one of these maybe it's called the Greenland shark. You know, yeah, it, one of these. It, it, but they have very boring lives. Trust me, it's all cold water down there. They eat salmon. That's the end. But they live four or five hundred years, and they, they do, still have they to deal. Do, they do. They, they still have to deal with with every you know with with micro with with pathogenic microbes like we do. So there probably isn't an absolute age limit to the immune system, but uh, I, I don't know, Vincent. I think a lot of it is just once you're, you know, at some point selection isn't going to work on really old individuals that don't breed anymore. That's right. I think I was thinking that's all about you've passed your reproductive age, so it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, ish. I, you'd have to talk to anthropologists about that because apparently, you know, apparently there's p potentially evolutionary reasons why older people are useful. This is true. Yeah. This is altruism. It's all about altruism. So I have a question that's sort of related to uh, talking about germinal centers. Um, you mentioned um, at the beginning of that answer the length of time that germinal centers are present and some of the newer research that has shown some of those germinal centers lasting for a few months um, following infection. This is something that came up during our conversation on immune yesterday and sort of um, blew my mind. There were many things that blew my mind yesterday. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your perspective. Um, so what do you think happens if we re-encounter the same antigen while a germinal center is still ongoing? So for example, I'm thinking about the two boost or the two first SARS-CoV-2 shots being close together and that the germinal center may not have resolved um, between those two. Um, is that really a boost? And is, does that have kind of a, a different effect on that germinal center than it might have if we let the germinal center resolve? Um, I, I, okay, so I think that happens all the time and I think it's fine. Uh, I would guess some of the issue with the timing of the immunization is also the levels of antibodies, because at some level there's going to be competition between a, an immunogen. So an antigen, once you inject it, is now an immunogen, right? Uh, so there's, there's going to be competition at some level between serum antibodies uh, binding to the immunogen and then directing it somewhere else versus the immunogen getting to the lymph node where it should be. And I think it gets really, really complicated and perhaps difficult to unpack at that point. Because it's really hard to have a mouse with a germinal center that doesn't have antibodies, right? To, to do that, to, if you want to break it down experimentally. So that's a, but those are really, uh, again, these are questions you would have thought would have been answered or addressed decades ago that, that really haven't been. And I think one of the most amazing things about COVID is it exposes how, how, how many holes there are in our knowledge about viral immunology in general and immunology in, in particular and, and immunology in general. It just, I've always thought we should have like 
every every lab should have a smart tenth grader, you know, as a, <laughs> as, a, as, a as a mascot. Uh, who you know, a tenth grader who's going to be a scientist or just as smart as we are, and actually smarter. I know because I think past twenty one, you know, you start getting dumber. But um, just someone to ask the most obvious, naive questions, which are often the best questions. And you, you should work with a, undergrads. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. You have that. But I, I think a tenth, a really keen tenth grader would would be good. Yeah, I, I love sixth of, graders actually. Well, <laughs> that'd be too young. They and uh, you know what kids learn in high school now is a, remarkable, right? But they're not afraid to ask any question. That's the point. So yeah, uh, and, yeah they're not afraid, and they, and they also they don't they don't know what's known. And you know, one of the problems with being exactly, an expert in something exactly, exactly. is you you just you're you're you you're just in the you really are in the box, and you've. You've kind of you've forgotten what things you don't know. So, uh, am I correct in assuming that uh, <laughs> in a uh, second or third immunization, you'll make new germinal centers, and that circulating B cells that have say been uh, educated in germinal center A can find their way to germ new germinal center B and continue their education? I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. I would guess so, but Gabrielle would know that. L listen to immune. Okay. Yeah. We talked yeah. about that. And yeah. the, the other the other question, just to really nail this down, I assume that during this whole uh, lifetime of a germinal center, there is antigen that was made months ago that's still there. Yeah, doing so that's, the education. Right again, something really underexplored. Uh, the follicular dendritic cell, as Brian knows, was discovered a long, long time ago. And the original work was done in the 70s and 80s. And I'm not sure how much of that has ever been extended. Because uh, that so blows my mind. The it blows my mind, too. Yeah, yeah but, okay, you know, but again, something else um, is that you, when a virus comes in or an mRNA vaccine, the information is there. Okay, so if I'm God uh, and I'm designing the immune system, I would keep that information somewhere safe. And it's never been completely ruled out that there isn't some depot of RNA or, or DNA, right, that is held. And every so often you translate a little bit, right, to make to, to boost the T cell immunity and to boost the antibody immunity. Um, so th there was this great debate between uh, Rafi Ahmed and Rolf Zinkernagel that Rafi won uh, scientifically, but Ralph may intellectually in the end be right, where Rafi said you don't need to have persistent antigen to have the whole thing, you know, everything work and memory and all that. And Ralph said, no, you always have to have antigen around. But in the end, you might have to, you, you actually might keep the genetic information around. Um, and there's a group at St. Jude, Julia Hurwitz, who actually has a proposal um, in Viral Immunology, the journal, to, to that to that very end, that you when you when you when you ex are experiencing nucleic acid based um, uh, pathogens, you save some of the information for for to, to keep boosting your immunity. And I think that's a you know it's kind of like CRISPR, right, where you incorporate the, the sequences in your genome. I think that's what I would do if I was designing the system, and it may it may do that. So so if you. Um all right, so if you've got some antigen around, and, and Gabriel said the same thing, and he said it's hard to study because there's very little. It's not huge amounts, and no. it's not amenable to our technology. Um, so why do we have to boost? Why do we have to give multiple doses, and in particular, why do we have to give SARS-CoV-2 boosters? Why doesn't it just keep going and make all the antibodies we need? Well, so there's, there's two levels of that response. Um, one is you would like to do that. <laughs> right? As a human being who wants to protect more people, you would want to do that. But the immune system in its own wisdom says, uh, I've done enough of this. And, right? And uh, it's good enough. And, you know, you guys are always bringing out the very important point that the immune system didn't evolve um, to prevent uh, positive PCR tests, right? The immune system uh, evolved to, to, so you could reproduce, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. It, it, you know, it's kind of like being a government worker. It's good enough, right? So making this kind of primary response, and you do maintain memory. It's not like we got rid of it, but there's probably the element there that that is good enough under most circumstances. And, you know, you might not think when you're in bed with 106 fever, you know, and, and crying for your spouse to help you because you could barely move that this is good enough. But as long as you recovered from that and you could have additional children in the days when you had big families, 
then the immune system would say, you know, mission accomplished, right? Uh, big banner. So I think there's that, Vincent. And uh, yes, you can do better by boosting. And uh, that's, you know, there's something that uh, as an immunologist, Brianna will be recognized as a hyper immune serum, right? And you would too. And, you know, anyone who wants to study anything, you, you, you want as much antibody as possible. Um, you know that you can boost up to three or four times, usually separated by eight weeks when you do it in the lab with rabbits, which is the typical animal. And you get a hyper immune serum where you can sometimes achieve a 20 or 30 percent of the total antibodies in that animal will be against the antigen you want, the immunogen you want, okay? So uh, that's great for having a reagent that you can use in a one to a million dilution and save yourself a lot of money down the road if you want to do whatever we scientists do, Western blots, immunoprecipitations, immunofluorescence. But for an immune system, there's a real danger in putting all your B-cell eggs in that one basket. And I think that's the other part of it. And, you know, again, if we're already talking about having four or five antibodies dominating our entire repertoire when we're in getting into our older years, what would be the effects of this hyperimmunization on maybe that's the problem as well, is that we're going to have we're going to make a, a bad problem even worse. So it's one of those things. You remember that commercial? I'm sure the uh, Brianne wouldn't know it, but the rest of us would. We, we old guys, uh, I, actually, I'm the youngest of the other group here at, at 68. Um, remember, uh, yeah, it's, you not, are. <laughs> it's not nice It's not nice to mess with number, Mother Nature for that butter commercial. Yeah. You, you remember that? What was it? Yeah. It was some, you know, margarine thing. And, and, yeah. and the, the woman, would, the, the, the guy was like butter his toast with it. And Mother Nature would come down with a lightning bolt and say, don't mess with Mother Nature. And I think there's a lot of that to the immune system where be careful what you wish for. And, you know, not that they couldn't have good clinical aspects, but w one needs to always think about, you know, p potentially the downside. Um, so, John, is there a downside to fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh booster shots then? That being said, no. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't think there is necessarily a downside. The downside would be, um, the downside would be that it's unnecessary. Right. And so then that's the issue. And then, you know, what are our goals? And that is something that we can't decide as scientists for sure. And maybe not even doctors can decide that. That's something that uh, has to be decided at the political level, actually. Right. Uh, what what are the goals? What do we view as an acceptable amount of disease? God, don't I know. let the politicians do it. No, well, <laughs> but but who's going to make that decision? Right. And in the end, it's a very hard decision. Maybe I that guy next to you. The guy sitting next to you. Um, it's Tony. a hard to say. What's again? What's an acceptable amount of disease? What, what's an acceptable risk? But All uh, that. John, for polio, they said we want to stop polio, and the vaccine did it. Very clear cut decision, right? Yeah, we want to stop COVID. That's it. We can't. You know this. We can't stop COVID, um, and we can get to this. Um, I think you and I had the same idea at the same time, Vincent, which is that. Um, you know, it's easy to vaccinate against things where there's a blood or a lymph uh, component of the of the viral uh, replication yeah. or transmission cycle. And, you know, I published this paper in PLOS Pathogens. I think in some ways it's one of my best papers where something I was, uh, I should have recognized 40 years ago, it took me a long time and I couldn't really find it in any textbook. I think the older guys kind of knew this, but no one had ever really written it down. Stan Plotkin came close. Um, when I presented it to our, our group, Bernie Moss, who's, you know, one of the scientists on my department, Bernie knew all about this, but not generally known that, um, you know, viruses that have to have to move through the blood to either cause disease or to be transmitted like polio, like smallpox, like a lot of things, like all of the, um, arboviruses, right. Where the insect is injecting your blood. Those are easy to vaccinate against. So antibodies in blood, antibodies in lymph, they kill, they are bam, they're perfect. Once you get to a mucosal surface, all bets are off. And there's not a single um, exception, I think, um, to the rule that uh, antibodies, the immune system, um, um, with at least a few months after exposure, no longer protects against reinfection at a mucosal surface. That appears to be a design feature of the immune system, right? You cannot protect against reinfection. You can protect against severe disease, Reinfection, you're just not doing it. Uh, and t tell me a virus that you don't get reinfected with. You know, flu is famous for this. And I used to think, oh, yeah, it's because flu is so good at changing. 
And now I realize that flu, maybe, you know, it's actually not as good as the other viruses because there are things like uh, measles, like um, the parainfluenza viruses, RSV, they don't change much. And yet they can still reinfect us every so often as, as flu does. So the immune system lives with that. And I think in the end of the day, the answer could be it's good enough, right? We, we're protected against disease. It doesn't get very far. We do have CD8 T cells, which we can talk about, which are primed as well, which probably do a lot of the heavy lifting and protecting us against uh, severe outcomes. But mucosal surfaces are, are extremely hard. And if there was a better way of making a, an effective immune response, um, certainly, you know, that's going to occupy a lot of research for the next couple of decades, I would guess. How do we optimize uh, the, the immune response in mucosal surfaces? How do we increase the duration? Because it, it looks that early on, uh, it works really well, but then it wanes, right? And but John, go ahead, but John de- evolutionarily speaking, if, you, if the immune system protects the organism against death, that's enough. You don't need to protect against infection, right? As you said, the immune system did not evolve to prevent positive PCR. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't. That's, that's right. So that, that could be the problem. And could we do better? We might be able to. But again, in doing better, there, there might be other things that happen. Right. But we don't have to. We don't have to do better if you save lives. And, you you know, in one of your reviews, you talk about the common cold coronaviruses, which now infect almost everyone, and you get reinfected, and mostly you're okay. And we can live with that, right? W- literally, we can live with that. <laughs> that, that. That's right. We do. That's right. And that's I think, right. you know, I think Ralph got it dead on right from the beginning, your first TWIV on corona, yep. where Ralph yep. predicted this is going to become a— uh, a seasonal coronavirus, and you know we don't know it's there yet. By the by the way, and you know yeah, you guys yeah. have these, you're going into details about you know exactly how pathogenic Omicron is, but it certainly looks like a step on the way to a seasonal coronavirus. Um, so, but you know this virus, every step of the way, have been has been so surprising, right? I mean, it's just. Um, it's been enough to occupy how many episodes? 500? 400 so, so what's what is your biggest surprise about the virus? Biggest surprise is how quickly it's drifting. All That's right. a shock. That's an absolute yeah. shock. Yeah, I, me so, too. Two things there. Jesse Bloom had this great paper you've talked about where Jesse showed that contrary to what everyone thought, coronaviruses are drifting basically at the same speed that flu is which is cool, right? But then on top of that, so that to, to put that in numbers, that's about a residue and a half um, per year in the spike protein, or, right, or the hemagglutinin. So uh, every year you get one or two changes in the relevant regions that, that help the virus escape the antibodies that you've made. Okay, Delta had what, eight changes in a year? Right, so that's four times the rate or five times the rate. And... Um, Omicron, 30. <laughs> oh, my God. There's 34 changes. That's right. And, you know, maybe over one year. So that blows away anything except um, viruses like, you know, HIV or, or hep- hepatitis C, which are constantly replicating at huge numbers in a given individual. The, the, so, the, the, the diversity there is enormous. But for an acute virus that has to go from person to person, the drift so, in this thing has been astonishing. So why is that? Is that is SARS-CoV-2 actually different in this, or is, or are the circumstances different because it's a new introduction? Yeah, I was going to say, is it because it's coming into a naive population? That's one possibility, right? I mean, that would be the best guess. But now, you know, it's, we're getting close. I mean, what the number in England a couple a month or two ago was ninety two percent of people were. Uh, one way or another, immune, either vaccinated or, or infected. So tell me another virus where you have 90% of the population that's immune, right? Actively immune. So if it keeps drifting, it's it's a new. And why we all thought it would be slower is, you know, you've talked about it in the last, maybe two, the last episode I heard uh, about the cor- uh, correction mechanism, right? Where it's, you know, maybe that was a different one. I may be confusing my podcast, but, um, you know, the, the, the base error rate of the polymerase looks to be tenfold slower than the normal RNA virus polymerase. So by that criteria, it should be drifting tenfold slower, right? But it's not. It's drifting tenfold faster. So there's a hundredfold change there. And 
One of the contributing factors, I would guess it is, is this high recombination rate, right? Which is which uh, which allows the virus then to rather un, rather than undergo sequential selection in a single genome, it can mix and match parts of the genome. So it can take one part of spike and mix it with another part of spike. And there was a paper I saw that um, was um, concluding that the Omicron was coming from something like eight recombination events, the, the whole virus. So I, I would guess that contributes, you know, other, like flu has this massive recombination rate, but between segments and not between one gene like the hemagglutinin. Um, uh, one of my colleagues mentioned the other day that lots of positive strand viruses have these high recombination rates, though. So they don't. Well, it'll, be inter- it'll be interesting to see what happens. OK, I guess we're going to oh, find I, out. I, right? we're gonna, we are yeah, rich. We are finding out. But, you know, th- that was to me the biggest shock, spending a good chunk of my career uh, trying to understand drift. And then, you know, of course, the, the, the clinical features that, you know, Daniel has discussed so well. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think part of it is just th- this, this uh, one of the silver linings of this uh, pandemic is that there are so many people with the same thing that now you can start to see what viral infections do and you've always missed it before, right? So something like chronic fatigue syndrome, which we, you know, you've just, you've had several episodes on this and it's really confusing and the etiology is uncertain. But now we're going to really know, like for this one virus with this long COVID, yeah. how a given viral infection, even not necessarily a severe one, can reset the immune system to set up this kind of slow and awful autoimmunity that, that gives you all these, um, these myriad symptoms um, that are very similar to something like chronic physique syndrome. So... Um, you know, just the opportunities and, and, you know, all the other things that happen, all the clotting disorders, all the other organs that are infected, affected, excuse me. Um, I think these happen all the time with other viruses, maybe not at the same exact frequency, but it's so easy to miss because you don't have so many cohorts of people with the same thing from the same obvious cause. So I think this is really going to be a revolution in our understanding of, of syndromes that go along with acute viral infections. So despite all the antigenic variation and Omicron, as you said, the, the most and almost completely evades convalescent serum neutralization, right? Still, though, the vaccines protect you for the most part against severe disease. Could So could continued antigenic variation change that or is that just at the level of uh, antibodies? Well, um, it, it, it's not going to get right. It's going to get worse for sure, uh, and that gets to the extent that the antibo- that the protection of the vaccine is based on uh, antibodies to spike versus T cells to spike, and the T cells don't necessarily have to be the CD8 T cells. Priming CD4 T cells also, if it's a conserved epitope, uh, that can also uh, help a lot, uh, and the epitopes for the T helper cells are on average, are going to be much more conserved than the B-cell epitopes just because they're from any part of the protein, basically, right? Including the internal bits that are more conserved and the parts that aren't under antibody pressure. So um, that's going to be a, a, a crucial thing to, to, to figure out. And that is not easy. Um, you know, one of the things you guys often talk about is why don't you just measure T-cells? Uh it is not easy to measure T cells, right? And yeah, if you're a mouse lab like my lab was for many years and you study this one virus and you have very good postdocs and you have expensive equipment like flow cytometers, yeah, you can study T cell responses <laughs> uh, to this one mouse strain that you happen to know that they have two MHC molecules. But we take a human being where there's two major restricting elements called HLA-A and HLA-B and each of these come in thousands of varieties and they all present different peptides. That gets really hard and people can't even standardize neutralization tests, much less T cell tests. And so studying T cells is not easy. And then even if you do do it, you, you're stuck in the end with correlates of immunity. You, you know, you, it's, you can't do experimental immunology in humans. And so without knocking out individual subsets or specifically immunizing in certain ways, you can't really know what's doing the protecting. OK, so maybe, you know, something that's not impossible. And I don't think it's too I don't it, it's probably even ethical. It would not be impossible to test a T cell based vaccine that doesn't induce antibodies. Right. And to look for clinical effectiveness. Certainly, 
maybe even in clinical trials, you know, with a challenge study. That that would be incredibly valuable information because um, I, you know, I am a 1,000% believer that we have to study mice to understand the immune response. At the same time, I, you know, I think mice are of limited predictive value in terms of what is actually protecting us in humans against a given viral um, pathogen. So to, to, to know what's going on in humans, you have to study humans, and th- that gets hard. And with something like most of our vaccines, they, they induce every element of immunology. And uh, a correlative protection, to me, what this word means is uh, it is something that correlates literally with protection. It does not mean that that's the thing that protects. Yeah, of course. It's not mechanistic. No, and, you know, the way the immune system works, generally, if you have a better antibody response, you certainly have a better T helper cell response because you need one to get the other. And generally, particularly if it's a a nucleic acid-based vaccine, you will have a better CD8 response. And so they're going to track together. And even with something like flu, which was the first virus that we had to find peptides uh, for for CD8 T cells, this was Andrew McMichael's work back in the in the um, in the 1980s. Even there, we don't really know how important the, T, the CD8 T cells are in in providing protection. So um, you know this this is not easy to know what is protecting us um, so, at, the, so, at this point. So John, okay, that I understand T cells, but there is this focus on neutralizing antibodies. When you said earlier. Yeah. Antibodies have FC portions and they do things that may not be related to neutralization. So are we missing something? For sure we are. But we don't know it, right? And it's it's hard. Another another example from the flu world. There was tremendous excitement, uh, some of which I, I think I helped create, uh, not for my own work, but just for publicizing it and, and organizing a meeting that really got everyone going about the antibodies against the part of the HA that's conserved, which is we, we call the stem. Right. It's the part under the head. It's under the receptor binding part. And, you know, uh, I and many people thought this might be a game changer for flu. Um, and it might still be. You know, you've had you've, you guys have talked about this extensively on TWIV. You've had Florian Kramer on, who's, who's fantastic. And Peter's been on and these guys have done great work. OK, how important are those antibodies in flu? Uh, it still isn't clear. And it turns out in the end that almost everybody has a pretty good stem response and you make a really good response after vaccination. And yet they certainly haven't solved the clinical problem with flu is that it makes you sick and kills old people. So, um, yeah, you know, certainly in a, in a younger person, if could you protect them only with antibodies that were not neutralizing? I, I would guess you could. Uh, they'd probably get sick. But is that what you want out of a vaccine? I, we don't know. And, and these are, again, they're not easy questions to get at. And then how they're working is not uh, even necessarily easy. We had a nice paper a couple of years ago where we showed that uh, in mice anyway, it looked like the antibodies to the stem were working by blocking the not the hemagglutinin itself, but its neighbor, the, the neuraminidase enzyme. Mm, yes, and, I remember and that. just the, yeah. way the, you know, the way the virus is, the way the yeah. architecture of the virus is, uh, for the people watching, I can I, can, I actually have a flu virus here just in case, Ta-da. right? So Beautiful. not a perfect depiction, but pretty cool. So um, the the HA is is this guy, the abundant one, and the mm-hmm. NA is the little one in between. And you can actually see from this representation that the NA is under the HA, mm-hmm. and you can easily imagine that if you had an antibody at the bottom of the HA, it would block the NA, and, mm-hmm. and it does. And so we nice. did this really cool experiment, Yvonne Kozik, in my lab, where he made a flu with a longer NA, so the antibody didn't work as well, and then it wasn't as effective in, 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 uh, nice. in preventing influenza in the animal. So, right. you know, uh, okay, who would have ever predicted that mechanism, right? right. So how these things work then, um, it's not trivial either to figure it out, right? And not to mention, you know, that the FC then attaches you to things like NK cells and macrophages. And one of the major things that does, uh, in addition to activating those cells, when they would, when they, so what can happen then? You have an infected cell with with SARS-CoV-2. You have an anab- you have a spike on the cell surface on the way to becoming a virion. And what would happen then is the antibody binds that, and then the NK cell binds that and kills the cell. On top of that. The um, antibody can, can take a virion, uh, a SARS-CoV-2 virion, and deliver it to a macrophage, which then eats the virus and kills it. So, and, and then other things as well. 
I'm sure. So um, how things work in vivo is really always very, very difficult. I think it's worth pointing out, too, that you can't sort this out in the course of a pandemic. It's not happening, right? Well, it's too fast. We're doing a good job. I mean, you know, I saw this is a cool number you may not have. Uh, okay, so how many papers per year so far on <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 in PubMed? Yeah, a lot. Right? Okay, and yeah, we take s- a guess. What do you think it is? Ten thousand. Yeah, I had a pick recently that was yeah. a yes a, um, yeah. image a on this, and it was in the like thousands. So. hundred thousand. Wow. Oh, yeah, but how many of those are? Thousand? How many of those thousand. are good? How many whatever. of those are any whatever, good? Whatever, right? whatever. Okay, but here's the cooler number. What is the denominator? How many papers per year on PubMed? 10 million? Uh, 1.6 million. Wow. It's so, 10%, huh? Y- yeah, well, wow. you know, it's 1 in 16, right? <laughs> yeah, but so, I don't think it means we're, not, we're learning more. I, well, think, uh, I, think we've, I think we have learned a lot. And uh, I gr- granted, you know, they're, the papers, be- because of their very nature, have been fast. On the other hand... You know, I mean, a single paper today would have more data than the four of us, uh, five of us, yeah, have of done in our whole career, <laughs> right? I mean, all together. Yeah. So, yeah, this, you know, as as science kind of gets harder because the questions get more involved, it also gets way easier because the the, the assays are just unbelievable, right? Yes. And the ability, sure. particularly to, to genetic assays. I mean, I mean, Vincent, to watch the evolution of this thing in real time on on NextSeq, uh, you know, holy shit, right? I mean. Uh, you know, many, cool. many of our dreams as virologists are being realized. Um, and, you know, and I think they, they, this has been going on. It's just with, with SARS-CoV-2, it really comes to the fore. And, you know, there has been some shoddy science by attracting people from other fields. But I think in the long term, this is a, a boon for virology. Um, everybody knows about viruses now. I think um, the world knows how dangerous these viruses are. And now we have this number as well that we can present to Congress. What is, what is the cost of a, of a pandemic? What is the cost of a pandemic mm-hmm. in a yeah. dollar value? And worldwide, that cost is something like $10 trillion. $10 trillion. Wow. For the people who don't know numbers, you know, like, like I do, the U.S. economy is like $20 trillion, the whole thing. So, you know, the U.S. alone is going to be a trillion or two or more. It's 10% of our economy. And Vincent, you know this. What's the NIH budget? It's 40 35 billion. Billion, 35 40, 40, billion. 35 billion. 40 billion now, right? Okay. And, and what percent of that is on viruses? What, what number on viruses? I have? Two billion, maybe? Maybe? Yeah. Right? Yeah, most, so, on, most on HIV and flu. <laughs> which are well spent. But, you know, uh, <laughs> obviously, we need much more money in, in research. And cancer is super important. And we all have friends, I've mentioned, who die from cancer, get sick from cancer. But year in and year out, cancer kills about the same number of people all over the world. The one thing that can wipe out humanity or a good chunk of it is an infectious organism, and particularly a virus. And, you know, it's not like we haven't been warning. We virologists that you know, viruses are coming, like Chicken Little, but this one came. And I think... The, the good news is it, it the more as bad as the mortality is what is it one two percent something like that it, it could have easily been twenty percent right and just to point out to people if HIV had been a respiratory virus it, it could have wiped out ninety nine percent of humanity just a few lucky people who have a CCR mutation right could be alive so viruses always will have this capacity for creating havoc in humanity creating havoc. And we ignore this. And at, at this point, how many examples, you know, it's just going to be completely stupid if, if countries around the world don't decide to ramp up funding for virus research and for vaccine research, right? Completely stupid. I mean, not that that's impossible. We know it. It's maybe even a likely outcome, but this is a, this is a drum we cannot stop beating, right? John, we're very good at stupid. We are. We are, but you know, it's, I, I, to me, it's just kind of amazing humanity has gotten this far, right? I mean, we're we're animals, and you know, we get along pretty well, actually. All well, things all, not think perfectly. The, tech, the technology we have developed to, is astounding to me. That yeah, we, as Dixon said, we can be really stupid, but I mean, just the texts we've talked about today is you know, genome sequencing, facts, and tetramer staining, and all this stuff. It's just Amazing. So it's, it's amazing. And yeah, so. uh, you, you young scientists out there, potential, potential young scientists, do not 
be disheartened. We haven't discovered True. everything yet. Oh, that's right. Uh, we're that's we're absolutely scratching right. the surface of the surface. Absolutely. If anything, this pandemic has told us all of the questions has helped us discover the questions that need answers. <laughs> I'm yeah. uh, still amazed though, John, about the number of people who don't fear this virus end up catching it and dying. And we've got a rate of about 2000 people a day that are dying right now from this virus. And that's low. I mean, we had a lot more uh, a couple of months ago, right? And that's last insane. year was even worse. It's, I and, mean, and these people, they, they're, they don't live in fear of dying from this virus because they deny a lot of the attributes of the virus. Well, <laughs> uh, it's obviously a failure of education. Really? Right? And they're not uh, listening. Well, we have to start. I don't mean education. Edu- I don't mean immediate education. We, we have to start teaching people about uh, what's important uh, with science at a much younger age. Everybody needs uh, some versing in what a vaccine is, how they work, just some, you know, some sense of how things work. And certainly to have a to get a college degree, I think it should be mandatory that you take a course in modern biology. We learn no, something about agree. genetics. I and uh, so, I, you know, I um, my colleagues and I and I had this idea a number of years ago that we should have a vaccine core, that we'd have uh, people on their way to medical school or graduate school for a year or two. They would go around to high schools, maybe 10th grade, something like that, and people more or less their own age and tell them how important vaccines are and explain to them. And I think we can use that more than ever now. The, the need for that is it's just absolutely obvious. The, the only chance we have is to try to get kids when we can educate them. Once they become adults, they're hardened. And, you know, I, I think the Internet, of course, has been overall a huge blessing for mankind. But at the same time, there are... Uh, what looking hi- hindsight, 2020 hindsight, predictable problems with it, that any sort of disinformation can be propagated. And, you know, we know that there are enemies of the truth in other countries that are deliberately propagating falsehoods. Um, and we just, the solution is not to give up. The solution is you have to fight tooth and nail for, for the truth. And somehow, despite all of these problems and humanity's propensity to believe in fairy tales, here we are, and we're talking to each other in this technology that, I mean, to, to, the, to all of us, including Brianne, we didn't ever imagine that this is like the Jetsons here, where we're talking to each other and seeing each other, and we're not 3D, 3D quite yet, but still, it's this really is true. good. This is true. And so, you know, science works. That's the message in the end, and we have to get that out, and we have to get people to appreciate science. Oh, of course. And and, you know, and they don't, even though they benefited from it every day, right. from the, no, right. the second they get up in the morning to the second they go to sleep at night, everything is technology. They somehow don't appreciate it. And they certainly don't appreciate the people who provided for them, who are the scientists and the engineers. And, you know, we need to make these. And, you know, Vincent has talked about this. We had a couple of episodes just on this. We have to make science a more attractive career. We shouldn't have our best minds working how to maximize the profits for themselves or the companies they happen to work for. We need our best minds working on things that matter, which is to make life better for the rest of humanity, which includes medicine and technology, right? And climate change. But, you know, so the two biggest problems on Earth, I'll just mention it. Climate change and then something we never, ever, ever talk about, but is actually much more important in as much as it can end humanity in 20 minutes which is nuclear exchange. Oh, yeah. Right? And um, the last few de- last few presidential races, the, the issue of nuclear missile technology and uh, nuclear explosives, that hasn't even come up as if it's not important. And yet this is the single most important thing for, for the health of, of ourselves, our families, our friends, everybody, obviously. And we just – we have this amazing ability – to ignore the things that are most important to us. We're all, we all have this, right? And we're all incredibly good at self-deception, but at some point it just becomes incredibly stupid, right? Correct. So, you know, there's a Fermi paradox, right? Which is why haven't we seen all the aliens that are out there? And, and one of the answers to this is every civilization that gets far enough along where they could actually find us, they kill they themselves. Just, right? Right. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. And, but the other uh, thing is, the biggest public enemy right now to some large groups is public health. Just the clear idea of clean water, yeah. safe food, 
of inspections. This is a violation of human rights. Are you? Where did you well, get that from? How did you make that up and, and other people would believe you? I don't you get know, that part at all. Uh, if you look at politics in America, there's this dysfunctional sign curve, right? <laughs> did you say sign fell or sign curve? <laughs> well, both. You know, it's a sign curve. And there's this predictable, insane p- part of the civilization that that becomes insanity. And this happens every 20, 30, 40 years, right? We go through these cycles of, of mass stupidity. And it's not just, you know, we're, we're all obviously left-leaning. It's also on the left. And bef- before COVID, most of the vaccine hesitancy, as far as I can tell, was on the left side, the far left. So it's not, you know, we're all susceptible to this. And again, you know, the people who are against GMOs, I mean, this is gen- genetically modified organisms. Th- this is insane to be against that. Do you want to you kill two billion people because they can't eat? Right. 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 And and nature itself is doing genetic modifications all of the time. But of course, that's the right. other I stupid mean, so, thing. <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 many of the societies we admire the most in Western Europe, where they really seem to have their shit together, they're the most opposed to, 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 to genetically modified organisms. Right. This is so uh, there's, but everybody, we all have guilt in this. We're all irrational in some way. All oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But. Where it gets really important, Dixon, is just what you're saying, where your irrationality that affects everybody else. Yeah, exactly. You're not allowed to endanger anybody else's life except your own. Go and, and how do you do that if you refuse to get vaccinated? You, you're di- you're well, obviously and, and, you're spreading. So at, at, at this point, the problem with COVID, they're not scientific. They are psychological. Yeah. Right? And, I mean, look and, at all and, the flack that Tony Fauci, I know you have a bubblehead doll right there. He's one of my big heroes also. In yeah. fact, we've picked him as a hero on a lot of our shows. And and now he's being vilified by people who have absolutely no knowledge of any of what they're talking about. And people are listening to them. Um, uh, I don't know this why. Is a guy, this is a guy who sacrificed, I would say, hundreds of millions of dollars to pursue his passion, That's which right. is infectious diseases, and Correct. arguably has had a greater effect on – on the reducing the burden of infectious diseases than anyone else alive. Here, here. And um, I, I feel honored to have worked for him in a way. Um, he's a distant boss, but he's actually, you know, uh, particularly in the early years when I was here, t- Tony was really involved with intramural research more before the Institute really grew and yep. everyone got to know him. And he's just someone who, um, he appreciates basic science. He That's appreciates true. creativity. And uh, because of him, um, NIAID has been, I mean, just a fantastic place to work. Um, and I, I just, I came here, you know, without thinking much about it. I thought I'd stay a few years and um, I, I just, it was the luckiest move of my life. I mean, I just, it's a heaven. And a lot of that comes from the people who set this place up. And, and Tony is one of them to set up a culture where you appreciate basic science and are willing to support it. Well, a so, lot of us appreciate your willingness to sacrifice personal gain for the greater good of humanity. And I've, I've known a lot of people that worked at NIH. I actually had some very good friends in the parasitology lab down there for many years. And uh, to see their offices, they all look like yours. Nobody has a view. They come to work at uh, five in the morning. They leave at nine at night. Um, they don't, they don't have a weekend to themselves basically because they've got experiments going on. Um, they're always, uh, thinking about tomorrow and what they're going to do. Uh, it's an amazing place because it attracts people with hearts of gold and minds of brilliance. I think you, you put those two things together and you've got the NIH. Yeah. Well, what, what the basic attraction is we don't have to write research grants, which is, (laughs) as, as we've discussed, you know, Vincent and I had a whole session on this. I mean, I, I, the grant system to me is nonsensical, and we have a perfect model for how to fund science, which is called the intramural program, yep. where you find good people, you give them money yeah, every four right. years or five years, you ask them, what did you guys discover? Yep. Uh, and you don't let their lab get too big, uh, right. and you just keep funding their research as long as they're productive. And this works, and then you don't have to get permission to do an experiment, and you just you go where your data take you. And where your creativity takes you. And this is a model that I think would work almost anywhere. And it's just beyond me. I mean, I I was involved with a group of people here trying to export this to the extramural system. And the the feedback we got was from extramural people who didn't want it. They wanted the grant system, which to me is the Stockholm syndrome. 
they they were comfortable <laughs> they were comfortable being hostages to study sections and I was in the grant system for a short time and I, I thought it sucked and I just I was so happy to get out of it and I'm so glad that I'm here and uh, you know what, what the sacrifices we make just to put it materially is we cannot be involved in any way with biotech companies we can't even have stock in a company that owns a biotech company so we can't be on boards we can't start companies we 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 can collaborate but that's it um and um um that that's uh, the sacrifice you make and for that we get guaranteed funding and our labs can't be very big because we're space limited uh so uh the labs are about half the size of a you know of a labs at, at really good academic centers but uh, the, the, the upside is we have fantastic colleagues. Uh, there's 1,100 labs on the Bethesda campus alone uh, and great immunology, as you all know, something like 200 immunology labs, maybe 100 virology labs all told. Uh, we have a, another fantastic part of our institute in Hamilton, Montana, a lot of great virologists there. Um, and so it's just, it's just been heaven for, for, for me to work here and just terrific colleagues and uh, just you know the the irony is this is this is the this is the ivory tower. Even though we're part yeah. of the government, right? I mean, we just have complete yeah. freedom. We yeah. don't have to justify what we want to do. We our justification is is in our results. The proof here is truly in the pudding. Uh, so so John, um, I probably shouldn't do this, but I just want to ask one more flu question because <laughs> we've had a nice diversion from uh, experimental science. So every year we check antigenic drift of influenza viruses, and we use antibodies. We use hemagglutination inhibition assays to say, oh, the titer has dropped. We're going to change the vaccine. So why do we do that? And here we are two years in, and we have a lot of drift with SARS-CoV-2, and the antibody titer has gone way down, but we're not changing. So why do we do it? What do we know about influenza that it tells us when HAI titers go down, we should change the vaccine? Well, I think it's just hard, hard earned knowledge that it does matter. So the vaccine, e even from the, you know, was, this was discovered in the 1940s when they started vaccinating against flu. There was a big change in 1947 with something that at that time they thought was a subtype, which wasn't. Remember H0, Vincent, mm -hmm. back in your Peter Palazzi days? So there was mm -hmm. H0 and H1, right? That was the first vaccine failure with flu was an H1, H1, H0 was not an H0, it was actually H1. It was going from like a PR8 virus to something else. And yeah, yeah. that ma it matters with flu. And, and so it does, it is useful to change the vaccine. It's not like there's no benefit. There is a big benefit. And what happens if you don't? Disease goes up? Yeah, disease goes up. You have more kids staying home from school. You have more older people that die. You have more people at home. And, uh, you know, the flu is, it, it's not COVID, but an average flu there. And the data are really crappy, right? We, we don't really know how many people flu kills each year. It's, it's based on excess deaths. And as you know, you know, the, all the viruses kind of go up together. And until now, there hasn't been a lot of really PCR you know, or PCR, just testing of what viruses people have. One of the really good outcomes of COVID would be if we really start doing this panel testing on everybody who comes in with a cold, right, who's sick. And then we really get an idea of the prevalence of the various respiratory viruses in human populations. Yeah, it matters. So flu in an average year kills something like 30,000 people. But the economic costs are estimated to be between 10 and $50 billion from people staying home. Okay, so now you, it does matter. It helps. Okay, we now have the universal flu vaccine, and it's also a universal vaccine for every virus. It's cheap. It's called a face mask. <laughs> <laughs> we know this works, right? Because there was zero flu last year, and yeah, we may true. actually have even come close, if not having achieved, the extinction of a whole lineage of influenza B virus. So now we know that face masks work that we're the silly ones and not the Japanese and the Chinese, right? The Americans would make fun of them when they would see them all wearing their masks in, in, in Tokyo and Beijing, et cetera. But so now what do we do? Are, are we going to all mask up now for the rest of our lives in the winter so we don't get respiratory viruses? I mean, here's a test of our own rationality. Do, do you like getting sick every winter? I, I don't. No. Am I going to wear a mask all the time? We'll see. So I think Amer Americans won't wear masks. No. Will, will you? Will you, the, I paragon, think, the paragon of rationality. Will you wear a mask? No, I, I am not the paragon. But I said in a I said in a previous twiv, uh, 
wearing a mask has made me realize how much of other people's breath I inhale on a daily basis. Absolutely. And I take a train, I take a subway all the time. So I might wear a mask on those, you know, uh, in my home, uh, in a supermarket, I might not. But yeah, there's some areas where you might. It'd be interesting to see that. So every, yeah. every year I go skiing with some friends to a place called Jackson Hall where they, they have this famous lift, which is a tram, which holds 110 people. <laughs> and you are in wow. this for 15 minutes and you are this far apart from the guy's mouth next to you and yeah, all around yeah. you. Every year I would get flu or something of like course, it for my of course. Of course. And I never put two and two together. Okay. So I will never set foot in that tram again, at least without an N95 mask on my face. <laughs> so that I will change my behavior. If it's in any kind of crowd in the winter, I'm going to be wearing a mask. And absolutely, I, you know, I think that's rational and maybe, you know, it's people don't go to a bar in the winter if you don't have to, right? A crowded uh -huh. one. Mm -hmm. I no, mean, just good point. some good logical point. things that would really reduce infectious diseases. And I don't know. Have you guys talked about The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis, this this book? No. 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 Oh, really? Okay. Well, that'll, that? be my, that'll be my pick if I get to make a pick this week. Okay? You can make a pick, yeah. Yeah, so that'll be The Fifth Risk. And it's Michael Lewis is this uh, fantastic author who, right out of college, he wrote Liar's Poker. Do you know him? A bunch of yeah, movies yeah, he's I, written and the movie about the defensive tackle from Mississippi. The, the, the Blind Side. Yeah. He, blind this side. is one of my favorite authors. Great guy. Yeah. Well, this book is about COVID and through the point of view of a bunch of different people and, and, and you will love it. And one of the things he points out from interviewing epidemiologists is this difficulty that human beings have with exponential growth. Right. And even us scientists, even though we deal with logs all the time, we do not think exponentially, really. You know, I think our, our, the way our brains calculate things, you know, how far that cheetah is behind us, that's chasing us, the car, you know, the bus that we're trying to, it's all linear. And so we have a real hard time with logarithmic, right? And the, the point being like Omicron, I mean, you see like this, whatever, a, probably a relatively small increase in our naught, you know, in the face of immunity. And this guy takes off like this shot, right? So my point is kind of the opposite. You do something that reduces by 20 or 30 percent the transmission rate person to person, have a huge impact on, on these, the prevalence of infectious diseases. And something like face masking, you know, it, you know, everyone was wearing these cloth masks, which turns out are not terribly effective, right? Right. I would love to see uh, some really controlled experiment with N95s in a community, a limited, you know, community that's small, maybe somehow a really good controlled experiment to see in an average winter what this does to the burden of respiratory infectious diseases. Uh, I bet it just knocks it down to zero. What's yeah. the name of the book again? The Fifth, uh, fifth Risk. Fifth no, risk. That, may, that, may, has, that may be, yeah, a, the, that may be no, a different his, book. What's this one? Yeah, his, his, his COVID book is The Premonition. The Premonition, sorry, it's not which The Fifth is, Risk. I've read that one. Yeah, sorry, it's The Premonition. What's the, uh, what's the author? Uh, Michael Lewis. Michael it's, Lewis. A premon it's, it's a premonition. The Fifth Risk is another great book about basically about parts of the government that everybody ignores, like nuclear. That the, the, He really goes off on the nuclear problem there. Okay. Yeah. Department of Energy is the Fifth Risk. This is this is more about public. This is all about COVID, the premonition. Um, and it's um, it is a uh, I think people will really enjoy this. Uh, so I have a question going back to what you were saying about vaccines and flu. Sorry. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned um, the need to think about uh, hemagglutination uh, inhibition titers and flu and changing the strains. And, you know, when we're talking about that, um, do you think that that is partially based on the fact that we're using an inactivated vaccine? Um, and do you think that the reliance on antibodies might be less if we were using a different type of vaccine? Well, we're going to try the mRNA vaccine, so we don't have to debate that. That's in clinical trials. I bet it's way better. But, uh, you know, the, the, um, the live attenuated, you know, the nasal flu that the kids get, um, it's better. It isn't that much better, right? I, it's kind of disappointingly, smallly better. So we'll see. Um, and uh, the, the mRNA vaccines, I think, are incredible. Just how good they are, the, how, how robust the immune response is. Um, so that I, I know that's in clinical trials. I just read something in the, I think it was the New York Times uh, two days ago that Moderna is thinking about a triple vaccine with flu, RS, respiratory syncytial virus, and and whatever the strain of coronavirus is. Wow! As a single shot vaccine. So what what 
a part of the flu virus are they using in the mRNA? That would probably be the HA. So, so something else is worth mentioning is that it wouldn't be the worst idea to put nucleocapsin in, in every uh-huh. one of these, right? So exactly. flu, almost every viral nuclear protein is a really good source of, of antigenic peptides. Um, one of the reasons is probably is it's a, it's a super abundant protein in most cells because you, you make a lot of it and it's easy to make peptides from it. Um, so this wouldn't be the worst thing to have in a, in a, in a second, third generation uh, mRNA vaccine. And we talked about this early. One of the advantages of the mRNA uh, vaccine with Spike is Spike is a huge protein. It's 1,200 amino acids, very large, for particularly for a viral glycoprotein. It's a size, it's bigger than most polymerases. So that helps a lot when it comes to uh, T-cell epitopes, right? Because just they're, they're basically like 1% of any sequence will bind any given MHC class 1 molecule. So the more amino acids you have, the, the merrier. Um, but broadening that uh, and nuclear protein, the advantage there is super conserved, of course. And, you know, um, one of the frightening things about COVID pathogenesis is it really has not been on a completely naive background. People do, you know, you talk to Shane, right? People have memory T cells that cross react. Um, yeah. So we haven't really seen um, a virus that is completely, like, except maybe Ebola, right? Where there's not a family member that's already infecting humanity. So COVID could have been much worse with, um, with um, uh, no immune background, and which also makes you appreciate the remarkable pathogenesis of the 1918 flu, because you had a completely immune humanity in terms of the T cells. Right. And yet, you know, of course, the mortality wasn't super high with that virus overall, right? It was a few percent, but- um, Wrong age the, groups. Yeah, the different age groups. Exactly, Dixon. So if you were, uh, yeah, if you were an antibody naive 20, 20 to 30 year old, then your risk of dying was something like 10% or more. That's right. So that, that's frighteningly pathogenic for if a virus. If the first right? world war didn't get you, the flu virus would. Yeah, that, that's right. So, John, do you want to hear our picks or do you want to go? Uh, well, I, I, that was my pick. Yeah, I got the well, title wrong, but the, the pick is. No, do you, do you want to hear ours or do you need oh, to no, leave no, now? No, no, I'd love to hear yours. No, no. All right, here yeah. we go. Dixon, what do you have for us? I've got the 2021 Natural Nature Photographer of the Year Award winner. <clears throat> winners, I should say winners. And this appeared in The Guardian. Um, the uh, consolidation of the winners appeared in The Guardian. And uh, the pictures are spectacular. Uh, they, they always are. Every year they are. Um, this is, I think, also sponsored by the uh, National Geographic but the, I, I just can't believe that people spend so much time waiting for the moment. When you look at these pictures, they captured moments that it looked like it could never happen. And yet, it, of course, it did. Great stuff, Dixon. I love these. You always come up with these great photography sites. Well, I love it's it. the time of year. This is the time they come out with all the winners of last year's uh, photo contests. So. <laughs> these are great. Some of these are amazing. They Dixon, truly are. Why? Why? What is, where is the snail? Ah, on a leaf. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> it's on a leaf. It's just minding its own business, shedding saccharia for schistosomiasis. No, that's not true. <laughs> Wow. No, so, no, Dixon, why do the why do the photographers wait? What is in it for them? Uh, you should see some of these winners. Um, you should go to their websites and see what they've produced, and you'll understand. This is um, international recognition for a talent which virtually every human being has. You can depress the shutter and take a picture. Anybody with fingers can do that. But these people are special. These people see things that nobody else sees, and they wait for the thing to come about that they envisioned, and then they take that picture. That's how they take their photographs. They sit and they wait. And they go to extreme environments in order to get these pictures, and they risk their lives, basically, to capture the moment in nature that no one else would ever possibly get to see. And I think that's why we're so astounded at them, because uh, they're just, they, they evoke our connection to the rest of life. When you see the snail picture, you see the picture of a, a male gorilla beating its chest up in the um, 
Ugandan uh, rainforest, uh, you you associate with it in some way <clears throat> because that's where we came from. That's where we, that's our origins in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, the nature the nature that we express in our own beings, and that's why these are so powerful. Brian, what do you have for us? Uh, so I have an article uh, that I read on New York Times website. Um, a, it's called "Their DNA Hides a Warning, But They Don't Want to Know What It Says," um, and it's about uh, some volunteers for biobanks who are donating DNA um, to allow for studies across health populations, um, and their uh, ideas about whether they do or do not want to know if. Uh, mutations are found uh, when their DNA is studied. And so um, there's a profile of both a person who um, got a phone call that said, we found some, we found a mutation, we'd like to talk to you. And they said, no, I don't want to know what it is. I know my family's medical history. I don't want to know more information. As well as um, some volunteers who said, yeah, please tell me and found out about sort of some rare mutations that they had. Mm, um, interesting. And um, so I thought that both sides of why an individual would, would make that choice were really interesting. And I also was thinking about kind of how this would work over time um, in terms of if you, you know, donate today, uh, how do you decide what is a mutation you should or should not know about and what happens if, you know, the paper comes out next year? Um, do they call you after the fact? It, I, I just started thinking a lot about some of these issues that I hadn't really thought about before um, with some of these biobanks that are uh, so useful to us in research. I just would want my whole genome sequence and I'll do it myself. <laughs> Honestly, that's kind of me too. And that um, way, and so, going forward, I, I could check, right? <laughs> right. Um, but the idea of what would you do if they called you um, right. was, was rather interesting. Hey, John, did you see that paper from... Uh, from what's his name at Rockefeller, but the CD8, CD28 mutation predisposing to uh, tree man syndrome? No. Casanova. No. Casanova. No. Cool. Yeah. It's, you, it's so, you, it's, it's, every kid should be sequenced at birth. I don't think it should be a question, right? Uh, and, I agree. Uh, yeah, and then follow the, you know, th so that's happening at various places. I, I think Children's Hospital for a long time now has been asking parents if they want the kids sequenced and then they can follow longitudinally what happens. Sure, and, sure. Yeah. And that COVID as well. So, so many opportunities for poly, yeah, how polymorphism yeah, affect antiviral immunity. And of course, Casanova has been the leader in this for a long time now. Yeah. Rich, what do you have for us? I have um, two picks. One is premeditated. The other is real time on the fly. That'll be a quickie. Uh, the first uh, premeditated one is this has been making the rounds, but I thought it was twiv worthy. As a New York, uh, and I'm sorry, a Washington Post article. It's been in several news outlets titled Czech singer Hanka Horka dies after intentionally getting infected by the coronavirus. So this is a, um, a, uh, a fairly famous uh, Czech singer who was against vaccination uh, and to sort of uh, prove her point, uh, hung closely by her husband and son who had been vaccinated but were cooking up virus and uh, got infected and uh, seemed to be recovering and then keeled over dead. Oh, okay. So, so that's <clears throat> just, uh, you know, we talk about you got your choice. Uh, you can get vaccinated or you can get infected. She made the choice to get infected and it was not a good outcome. So, so you, you guys know about the Darwin Prizes? I was yes. just yeah. going to say yes. Uh, they haven't made the Darwin, uh, Darwin Awards for uh, 2022 yet. I was looking that up. But this, that uh, this would be a, this would be a candidate for the Darwin Awards. Rich, yes. maybe you can nominate her officially. Good idea. Uh, so the others are quickie. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. So I looked that up. And uh, the margarine was chiffon. Chiffon. And I, found, <laughs> I found an article in the New York Times. The uh, woman who did that is one of these, uh, you know, personalities that was based entirely on a commercial. And uh, she died uh, in oh. 2020 at the age of 91. Her name was wow. Dana Dietrich. So Thank you. So read about that yeah. in that book. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so the last few weeks I've had uh, YouTube's channels as my pick and – uh, today, I want to pick one called Cuore di Chocolato, which means chocolate heart. 
it is a cooking channel, and um, ah. this is an Italian an Italian fellow who there are many cooking channels. There are a lot of Italian ones, but his personality is really good. Yeah, and he shows you how to make things. You know, breads, pastries, liqueur, olives, um, pastas. Cool. And then at the end, this is the best. He's, he's just wonderful description of it. Nice guy. And then at the end, he samples it. And of course, he always likes it. And he, and he twirls his hand around <laughs> <laughs> because he's so excited about it. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's one of uh, a couple of Italian cooking channels that uh, I'm going to pick in the next uh, couple of weeks. Cuore di Cioccolato. Very good. Uh, it's really good. I really like it. And we have two listener picks. First, we have Bronwyn. Greetings from Sydney, Australia, where it's 24C with storms. I just listened to the 2021 wrap-up and shared your sense that 2020 and 2021 have blurred into one. Discovering TWIV was a silver lining in grim times, although we have had it better than many in Australia. My mother was in aged care, which has been tough everywhere. My pick is an article that does a great job wrapping up reasons for keeping schools open in spite of the explosion of Omicron. We don't know exactly how many people have the virus because there are now too many people to test, but I now personally know seven in the last week, whereas previously I knew one in the whole pandemic. Fortunately, all who could were vaccinated. I know there have been similar articles in U.S. publications, but I like the way these local doctors one of whom I should admit I know personally consider both their own and other research and make what I think is a really solid case. We have been incredibly careful about COVID-19 here in Australia, which makes the process of adjusting to new circumstances really challenging and emotionally fraught. This article brings some of the same careful, rational thinking I hear every week on TWIV to a naive to use a virus pun uh, audience. And she sends a link to the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, it's time for children's lives to return to normal. Schools must stay open. Uh, thanks so much for all you do. And we have one from John who is uh, sending some pandemic humor. It's a video of a horse race. And I watched it and I don't get it. So maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe I have a bad sense of humor. <laughs> I, I don't get it. I mean, there's, so there's the whole race. They go around a track. There's grass. And then there's a winner at the end. And then it cuts to some other horse that's running all by itself. But I don't know where it is in, in respect. If it's really last, if it's just keeping running after the race is over. I don't know. They don't explain it. So, <laughs> But anyway, thank you, John. What's the name of the What's horse? That? Omicron? <laughs> <laughs> that would win, Dixon. <laughs> Uh, Dixon, if you owned horse racehorses, would you name one Omicron? Mm, no, not at all. Uh, uh, Vincent, did you uh, watch this with the sound on? No. <laughs> okay. The, the commentator is uh, the horses are variants that are racing each other. Ah. Omicron I variants. Got it it's right. all about. You got it right, Dixon. Yeah. Yeah. Bingo. So th th their names are variants, really? Well, uh, no, not on the screen. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. But you got to listen to the. Yeah. You got to listen to the yeah. the caller. Okay. Oh, because I was looking at the screen. There's yeah. Avenge, no. Catch a no. Glimpse, you know. I just, oh, okay. I just listened to a bit of it, so at least some of it is about uh, variants raising each other. Okay. Omicron Got by it. eight lengths. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. The winner is Beetlebomb. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. All right. That'll do it for TWIV 857. Show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send us your questions, comments, picks. TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, Consider supporting us. We're a 501c3. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today stayed to the very end, John Udell from the NIH. Thanks so much. Always great to have you. Absolutely. Uh, great, great pleasure. Good to see you guys. It's the first one I've done with um, with a video, so it's fantastic. Oh, I love your office. Your office is, is fabulous. and um, It's fab yeah. fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. It, it, you know, shows your personality. You Don't collect change stuff. a thing. Uh, crazy. We love you. We love you just like you are. <laughs> just this side of crazy. <laughs> well, that's what you need to be to be a scientist, right? I, I, that's my argument. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org, the living river.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. And I'm going to make a plea. John, you should become a regular member. I, I'd be happy to, actually. We yeah. would love you to. 
Uh, Rich I'm Condit. waiting for the call. All right. <laughs> Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Always a good time. Get vaccinated. Brian Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I had a lot of fun today. Uh, today, my face hurts from smiling so much after all. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Her but motto is smiling, be sell or be square. <laughs> yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Hello.